Okay, uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And the topic is going to be uh, portable sawmills and expanding that business. And I think uh, I think Dr. Bond called this. Uh, you have the you have the sawmill now. What? What are the next steps? Looking at how to expand this into a um, into a viable business. And Dr. Bond, our presenter tonight, he's a professor of sustainable biomaterials and an extension specialist at Virginia Tech. He's also the Associate Director of Virginia Tech's College of Natural Resources and Environment, Environmental Leadership Institute. So, uh, so Dr. Bond, thank you for joining us this evening and I'm gonna turn this over to you. Absolutely, thanks for, thanks for hosting us. I really appreciate it. It's, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun, I hope anyway. Um, okay, share my screen, get this on here, get this going. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Yes. Um, so, you know, we were talking about exactly how to frame this. And so I kind of just threw out the title of, you know, have a portable sawmill, what now? And so there's a lot of ways we could approach talking about portable sawmill business. But uh, you know, since this is our first go at it, I figured we'd just assume you know nothing. Right. And, and some of you have been in this business Poor Tom is going to be like, well, I could have told you that. Right. But a lot of folks I, from a lot of folks will call and say, I've retired. I got a portable sawmill and I want to start a business. Right. And, uh, you know, my first question to him is, you ever, have you ever used a uh, can't hook or a PV? And when they say, what's that? I know we're, we've got some trouble coming. Right. <laughs> and so this, is, this presentation is kind of over the years comments and questions as I talk to folks starting a portable sawmill business, the things that I would want you to consider if you haven't already, if, you, if you're thinking about this, not as necessarily as if you're well established. So that's the point of view that I'm coming from. Um, that's my buddy Dave Boyk there. Um, he, he does some videos for Norwood Sawmill. Uh, great guys, got some good information out there. Um, but this is a, you know, it's a, it's a difficult labor intensive business. Um, you know, I, when I retire, I'm looking forward to, to, to handling lighter things in life. Um, and so, you know, we're all here probably because you think sawing is fun. I mean, it's fun. It's fun to put a saw into a tree and, and see what comes out. I mean, it's just amazing. It's beautiful stuff. Uh, it's exciting when you first get that mill to, to peel that bark off and see what's underneath and, and to, to to see what's coming out is a very exciting thing, but how do I how do I go from that to to really making a living doing this? And uh, it, it's it's difficult. It's a it can be very challenging because well, let me see if I can scroll through here. There's a lot of factors involved that, that a lot of times we don't think of because we're in it because we love it, right? Uh, and a lot of times what we like to talk about, you know, what I like to talk about is let's put the saw in the wood and how do we saw and and uh, how do we quarter saw? What's the best way to get grade out of a log? And those are the things we really like to talk about. Um, but I think tonight, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these things. But I think it's really important to talk about the business side of things. And sometimes we don't like to focus on that. It's not, it's not as much fun to pull out the calculator, break out the spreadsheet. Um, and so I think if you're thinking about doing portable sawmill as a business, you got you to start with, you know, where you are. Where'd you come from and why are you here? Uh, why do you want to do this as a business? You know, are you out to make a profit? I mean, that's, that's different than say, going out to have some fun. Um, do you want to be your own boss? Do you want to help the community? Are you trying to capitalize on an interest to something that you really love? And keep in mind when you turn something that you love like a hobby into a business, sometimes it's no longer, it's not quite the same level of fun because instead of being something to take your mind off your troubles, it sometimes brings you the troubles, right? Um, do you want to make some product? What, you know, what's it about? And you got to think about why you want to make this a business before you move on to the next thing, right? I mean, that's an important thing to ask. And once you know that, then you kind of figure out, well, what business do you want to be in? Like, you know, what does saw milling mean? Are you going to, are you going to custom saw for other people? I mean, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of portable sawmills do that, right? That's the one of the niches that you have. You can drive them to someone's property. You can custom saw for them and charge them a, a board foot fee or an hourly fee. Uh, that is a very different business than I'm going to make lumber 
and I'm going to be in the lumber market and I'm going to sell lumber to customers. That's a very, very different business plan. That is also different than selling specialty products. You know, specialty products, being in a niche market is going to give you the highest possible value for what you're doing. Um, but that's a different market. That's a different raw material, right? Um, are you interested in portable saw and to make things that ultimately make secondary products like furniture, flooring, cabinets? That is a different business model than custom sawing for people and making lumber. So you got to think about what business are you really, what do you want to be in, right? I mean, you got you to gotta start there. What is it I really want to do before you get too far down the road, right? Because if you think about it, does sawing lumber make money? I mean, that's what I like to talk about. How do we saw lumber? How do we maximize yield for a hardwood saw log? How do we quarter saw material? Um, how do we do that stuff? But does sawing lumber make money? And this is kind of a sad answer, but no. The way you make money is you sell that lumber to somebody or you sell that service to somebody. And so we're going to talk a lot tonight about, about a little bit about marketing, a little bit about where the, you know, what certain type markets are, a little bit about processing, but I, you know, I want to focus on the business side more than the processing side, because, you know, you can sell all the lumber you want, but if no one comes on your lot to buy it, you don't make any money. Uh, and so that's kind of the aspect we're looking, going to, going to look at here. I, I hope you can see, see on my screen there, um, you know, you may have a great product that everybody needs, but if they can't find you, that's a, that's a that's a big that's a big problem, right? And you know, a lot of times when you're in a portable sawmill business, you're in that business because you like to you like to see what's under that bark. You want to cut that tree up. You want to see what's there. You want to see the the fruits of your labor at the end of the day. Marketing doesn't sound that exciting to you, but but imagine, you know. <laughs> When I was a kid, if you'd have told me that someone could sell a bottle of water to me at a gas station for more than a gallon of gas, I'd have told you that you were nuts. I can just go to a tap and get water. Well, marketing, people have marketed water in a plastic bottle so that 20 ounces of water cost more than a gallon of gas right now. It's crazy. And so marketing can be incredibly important to you, right? Incredibly important to get the highest value for your time. And we're going to kind of focus on that a little bit tonight, you know, depending on what kind of mill and setup and what you're going to be doing, you want to get the most value for your time. Okay. Um, now I'm problems advancing here. Let's, let's go forward. So, you know, you can, can you have a business doing this? Sure. You know, you start out as a hobby and you get a little machine and you start cranking out lumber and, you know, can I make, can I make money doing this? Well, well sure you can, but, but, <laughs> But look at the piece of equipment that person has and look at the, the quality of the log that person has. And imagine how many board feet, you know, if you're trying to sell and make a living by sawing board footage per day, you know, what is, what is this system going to get you? Now, if you're sawing slabs and you're getting an absolute premium for that product uh, and you're able to dry it and sell a dry product, well, then maybe this is the production system for you. But what market are you in and what, what, what products are you trying to produce at what value, right? You know, when I think of portable sawmill business, I, to me, this is the, the bottom end. This is, this is where you would start, right? A manual machine, uh, sawing some pretty good logs. But again, you know, the type of machine is, is going to limit or could potentially limit what your, your uh, profit is going to be at the end of the day. So how much can you do if you have to hand turn that log with the cant hook? You've got to push that saw through, you've got to off bear, you got to do all that by yourself. And if you're charging, you know, board foot per hour, the end of the day, what are you going to have versus a system like this? Now, I, I'm not pushing these sawmill systems. I, I quote borrowed these off the internet, but the difference for, you know, between that previous picture and this picture is if, if, you're sawing for board footage um, charge per day. Uh, I can crank it out with a system like this. I've got a, an automatic way to turn the log. Uh, I've got a way to uh, you know move that saw back and forth uh, rapidly. I've got a, a way to you know make my blades last longer. I got a debarker on there. And so when I think about lumber production, if that's what you're going for, 
you know, fully automated machine is, is going to be better for that. You know, if you're sawing slabs with the highest value, well, maybe you don't need that. Maybe a lower production per day with a higher value product, you can do it. But these are the types of things that you need to think about on the front end um, when you're thinking about your business plan. You know, what type of machine do I have? What products, you know, am I going to be looking at? You know, the other thing to look at in this picture is look at those logs, right? If I'm sawing uh, grade for grade lumber, those are big logs. Uh, they've got a fair amount of high grade material in them. Uh, and so it's a lot different than if I just got free logs from a tree service, right? And I was in the grade lumber market and I had low quality logs. What am I going to do with all that low quality material, right? And so you want to match up your, your business with what your raw material input is with a product that has hopefully the highest value for it, or, or at least the service, right? You're, you're going for the largest thing. You know, who makes the most money in the portable sawmill business? Well, I think the people who make sawmills do. Um, and, and one of the problems with a portable sawmill business, and I'll say it's a problem, is that the entry into the business is fairly small. In other words, what keeps someone from coming into the business is buying a sawmill. Once you buy a sawmill, you're in there, right? And so the, the cost of entry into the business is fairly low. Uh, and so you've got, you've got a lot, you can have a lot of competition. And the other thing I see is there are probably as many folks that get out of portable sawmilling every, every year as get into it. Uh, and a lot of people get, you know, one in five businesses typically fail in general for general business purposes ac across the board. I don't know what it is for portable sawmill businesses, but I, I've seen a lot that, that move through. There's a cycle of businesses. And that's because I think a lot of the things we talk about tonight, people don't think about uh, until it's kind of too late once they're already in there. So this is, a, you know, example of, of the number of machines out there that are used for sale. There's a lot. And why, why is that? If it's such a strong business, why is that? Well, I think some, sometimes people jump uh, before they really look at, at the things we're talking about this evening. So one of the things I'm gonna strongly encourage you is to think about a business plan. You know, think, think about your objectives. Do you wanna solve for others? Is that, is that your goal? You're gonna provide a service and haul your mill out there? Uh, do you wanna saw lumber for the flooring mill down the road? I mean, I, they, they need lumber from me. They're going to give me a, a fixed price for what I bring in. It's a guaranteed, you know, it's a guaranteed income, um, but it's a, you know, it's going to be a fairly low value. Uh, or do I want to saw lumber for woodworkers? You know, what do you think the average woodworker uh, buys per year to make a hobby woodworker? How much lumber does the hobby woodwork market buy per year? You know, it's about a hundred board feet per year. Hmm. That's not going to keep your business going, right? So wh what is your business? Maybe I'm going to sell to cabinet makers. You know, I've got cabinet makers in the area. I've got uh, people who do molding and trims and new houses. Well, the problem is, do they use green lumber? Uh-oh, right? If I have a dry product, I can enter that market, okay? Uh, but now I've got another imp now I've got another capital expense. i got to buy a dry kiln. And if I'm running that dry kiln and load loading the dry kiln, then I'm not selling the lumber, right? Hey, I've heard I can make a lot of money sawing slabs. That's a big thing right now. But who buys green slabs? How do you dry slabs? You know, slabs are thick material. They're difficult to dry. You're going to have that inventory on hand for a long period of time. So your cash flow becomes an issue, right? If you sell boards and you sell green boards um, and you can sell them as fast as you can saw them, you've got cash flow. In other words, it's coming in as your lumber's going out. You start doing thick stock and slabs. Now you got to let that stuff air dry for a long period of time. You got to put it in a dry kiln. It's going to cost money to dry it. Any degrade that occurs is going to take money out of your profits. Um, now all of a sudden, cash flow can be a bit of an issue, right? Um, so these are things to, to consider. You know, think about a, a, a business plan. Um, you know, think about what your local market is. Uh, are you going to? Are you in an urban area? Are you like 500 miles from an urban area? Um, what, what is your local market going to buy? If you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's hard to get to an urban market, you know, maybe barn boards and fence boards are your, your high value area. Maybe uh, sawing railroad ties and pallet cans is where you want to go. Think about what your local timber supply is. You know, an example is, you know, here in Blacksburg, if I want to sell redwood, I've got to haul logs across the United States. That's not very smart, right? I, I'm in prime oak and hickory and yellow poplar country. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to be working with, right? 
And who's your local competition, right? How much competition is there? And if everybody in your local area is custom sawing and hauling their mill out to, to custom saw, maybe there's an opportunity for you to be in a different market, right? Producing slabs, producing something niche, you know, niche product at a fixed location. Um, what are your cost of operation? And believe it or not, you know, I, I've talked to people and they price their lumber based on what the local price is. Hey, this guy's, this guy's getting uh, 12 cents a board foot. So I priced myself at 11. Well, if, you, if, your machine, if your bank loan on your machine and your new truck costs more and you might be making, you might be making, you know, $5 an hour at that point. Um, so think about your cost of operation. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, and profit, you know, you got to put profit in the equation as well because you're going to reinvest hopefully in that business as, as time goes on. So I will encourage you, this is just an encouragement. We're not going to talk any more about business plans, but get out there and look for some of these materials on the web. Look at, uh, uh, this is the one on, the, on my right is the business management practices, uh, forest products firms by Bob Smith and Omar Espinoza. You can download that through Virginia Cooperative Extension. Uh, you know, you can download um, lots of stuff out there, extension publications on writing a business plan. And I highly encourage you to go through that process. Um, why? I'll, I'll tell you a little story about um, the Leadership Institute. We do a, a project every year and I tell the students how to, how to develop a project plan. And we spend a whole class period on project plans. I have them develop a project plan. And then they, get, they, they finish this project throughout the rest of the year. And then at the end of the year, we, we wrap up and we talk about, you know, what would you have done differently? And, and every single year, a group of students says, I wish we paid more attention to our project plan. We probably could have avoided some of those pitfalls. The problem is we don't want to do these business plans. They're, they're, they're not why we're in the business. We're excited about putting that saw through the lumber. Um, Doing some planning on the front end can help uh, help you to avoid mistakes as you move through. Uh, and so that's all I'm, I'll say about business plans. Uh, I, and I'll, I will mention in there, you know, you, you want to be insured and you want to be a limited liability corporate. You want to be incorporated, right? You don't want to take on the personal liability um, of, of this business. So make sure you include those things in, in, in your pricing and in your plans. So. Let's look at some of the opportunities that you have, you know, providing a service, sawing for others is one of the most common ways that, that folks start out making money with a portable sawmill. I mean, but you gotta like working with people, right? A lot of people getting into portable sawmill business, like I wanna be out in the woods away from people, right? I mean, that I, leave me alone and I can do a lot of cool stuff. Well, if you're gonna saw for others, you need to be a little extroverted. You want, you got to like people because it's your reputation. It's how you interact with those people um, is very important for, you know, being a contract saw, in my opinion. Um, you got, you got to have good customer relations. Um, you've got an advantage. You're mobile. You don't have to worry about slabs and sawdust. It's all on site. Um, but, you know, it's a great way to, to kind of, to kind of do a business, but you got to know what you're doing, right? Dealing with people can be very difficult, right? You know, you get on site and they say, oh, yeah, just saw this lumber up for me. I'll pay you 12 cents a board foot. And then they come back and say, well, no, I wanted thicker material than that. You know, four quarter, what's that? That's an inch and an eighth. I wanted exactly an inch. Um, you've got to got to be able to communicate with the people what you're doing, what they want. Some people don't have any idea. Um, and so you've got to try to get those expectations out there in the front end. Um, and know how to do what they want to do. They may want you to do some quarter sawing, some thick slabs. Uh, and you can pick that up along the way, right? Make sure you consider travel and setup costs. So why do I put that in there? Believe it or not, there are people get in the custom sawing business that just charge board foot per hour and never think about, <laughs> you know, how far away is this sawing job and how much is it going to cost me to get there? And oh my gosh, you get there, and there's nowhere to set up. And so you're, you're leveling that machine up for extra time. Think about building those costs in there um, and in your contract. Always have a contract when you're doing this stuff. Um, you know, think about if you're custom sawing for someone and you're driving out on site, what do you do when it snows? What do you do when it rains? Um, what do you do when the logs aren't where they're supposed to be? Um, these things can really impact how much you can make doing this type of business. And so you got to do a lot of planning up front to make sure everything's ready to go so that you can maximize your board footage and, or, or time out there, or at least you have to charge appropriately to try to avoid some of these problems. Um, 
So some general things, you know, for, for a custom sawing, sawing business, you got to be a people person, I think. Um, you should have a website at least. Uh, this is Paul Garrity from uh, Eastern Virginia. Uh, Paul's got a Facebook page, you know, have a Facebook page. Um, you know, that's not what you want to do. You want to be, you want to be sawing lumber. Um, if you have a son or a daughter or a wife that's good with the computer or a husband that's good with the computer, um, get somebody to put together a Facebook page for you. Now you might say Facebook pages are for kids. No, they're young adults now. Young adults are using a lot of Facebook. Um, Craigslist is another good one. Um, I think uh, Tom the Sawyer is on tonight. Well, just Google Tom the Sawyer and look at his website. You need to have a way to that people can look out for you and find you, right? Very important. I, I get calls all the time, who in the area saws? Because they can't find people who saw, right? I mean, you can get through, if you buy a saw from Wood Miser, they'll put you on their site and list them. But be proactive about getting your business information out into the community. Incredibly important, okay? How can you maximize getting the word out there? It's incredibly important. And then when you do put that information out there, for heaven's sakes, if you have a website and an email address on there, check your email. You know, I'm, I'm just working on the house. Um, I've got to the age and biz, busy now where, and I just don't know everything. I, I try to hire contractors to do some work. And, but if a contractor doesn't call me back uh, within a period of time, he's gone. <laughs> If a contractor doesn't show up and doesn't call me and say, hey, I'm not coming out today, psh, I don't hire him again. So think about these things. Make sure once you set these things up that you're updating them and that um, you're checking in and, and responding to people in appropriate time. Ways to charge for custom sawing. Hey, by the hour is great. Um, you know, rates vary from wherever you are, but make sure you include your travel time and uh, cost for broken blades. I mean, it, 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 it's very important to get that in there. But the advantage of charging by the hour is a lot of the risk gets transferred to the customer. In other words, if they haven't set up the site for you, if the logs aren't there when they're supposed to be, if they're not clean, and you got to take the time to do it, right? That transfers things over to the customer. Um, a lot of times you'll see people say, well, you know, charging by the hour encourages them to provide an off bearer for you. Just be aware with the when you use someone on site as an off bearer, you could potentially incur liability with that. So just, just be aware, a lot of people talk about that. You make sure your insurance is gonna cover that person if there's an injury on the site, all right? Because a lot of times those people have nothing, no idea what a slab weighs and tripping over things and it, it can be more, more of a hassle than it's worth. Charging by the board feed is also very common, right? Um, it puts, a lot, it puts the, the burden on you though, right? Um, it's a great way to get a good return in a day if you've got a fast machine. Uh, keep that in mind. If you've got a fully automated machine and you're ready to go, you can crank out a lot of lumber. Charging by the board feet can be a great way to great way to go. Make sure you put your blade costs and travel costs in that in that board foot cost, um, and 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 get some experience about you know are people going to have the logs there? If you're charging by the board foot, they're not quite as motivated to get that stuff for you. Um, can you make money doing this stuff? Well, I, I, rather than come up with an example and have you all tell me my numbers are nuts, I went online and pulled this off of the Cook Sawmill website. And so I'm just going to run through this real quick. You know, if you can produce 2,500 board feet per day, good luck doing that on a manual machine. Let's say a fully automatic machine with, with maybe some help that doesn't get paid. Uh, and you cut one inch board. So in other words, there's no pallet camp in the center, there's no tie. You're cutting it all the way through, uh, through and through four quarter boards. Um, and let's say their example, they're, they're using 15 cents a board foot, you know, uh, $150 per thousand. That seems pretty high to me. Um, their expenses are a gallon of, of fuel, 10 gallons of fuel per day and a bandsaw blade they say is about 1.5 cents per board foot. So those are my, my production and my expenses. Um, if I can solve 2,500 feet a day at $150 per thousand, I can get about $375 of income. My expenses um, are only about $162 a day. My gross income is $375. We got $212.50 a day. Crank that out for 20 working days a month. My profit for the month is about $4,000, about $4, a little over $4,000. It works out to about $51,000 a year. Hey, and if I want to give up my Saturdays, I can make about $62,000 a year, right? Yeah, that sounds great. What's not in this example? Well, the insurance costs aren't in that example. 
they assume that you've paid for the machine. Well, because otherwise you got a, you got a loan, right? And then, well, what about that big truck I had to go buy because my little Toyota wouldn't haul that machine as far as I wanted it to? Well, then I got another loan I got to put in there. And so there are, there are a lot of other expenses that are not in this example. Uh, and, you know, 15 cents a board foot, maybe you can get that, maybe you can't. We'll look at some examples and see how realistic that is. So this is their example saying, it, it, you know, you can make money doing this. But, but you know, I would say... Um, a niche market is going to get you significantly more with significantly less effort and work. And we'll talk about that. Share basis is also, you know, I, I'm always amazed that people that do share basis and like it, um, but some people do, they do very well. And that's where you get a percentage of the lumber that comes out of the logs. The problem is you got to, again, you can't make money till you sell that stuff. And so you've got to be spending some time either drying that lumber or selling it green and having a market for it. Um, and so that, that to me is a little bit more risky, but a lot of folks I talk to like, like doing a percentage uh, for, on a share basis. But a lot of this depends on what you're cutting, right? So you take a nice, nice look at that wonderful piece of material there. Some of you probably see a beautiful slab and I just cringe and see broken blades and low quality lumber. Make sure you're charging right. Like, and you know, in a job like this, you wanna be charging by the hour, not by the board foot, right? Um, think about, Think about your raw material and what you're dealing with uh, on how you should charge. And always, always have a contract. One of the things I suggest you do is, is um, one of these analysis. You can type in developing a custom portable sawmill enterprise in your, in your computer there. And there's an extension pub. Uh, I think it's, uh, I can't remember where it's from. Uh, see if I can, if it's down there. I think it's Cornell. But they have a, an Excel spreadsheet. You can download the spreadsheet and what it's going to do is it's going to put all these costs in there that we talked about. You know, that little example I gave you from, from Cooks does not include, you know, the sawmill purchase price, the loan, the interest on the loan, uh, all of these things, employees. <clears throat> this little spreadsheet online will do that for you. And I encourage you, before you do any pricing, download that spreadsheet and run through the analysis. Because you want to make sure before you start charging that you've got your hourly rate in there, you've got some profit in there and that you're paying off the loans as well as your expenses. So take the time. I know it's not as fun as running a saw through, through wood. Take some time to download that spreadsheet and run through it and make sure that your prices are gonna end up giving you what you want at the end of the day. Because ultimately, if your prices are significantly higher for, from, than the competition and you need that to make money, then maybe you're either in the wrong market or the wrong product, right? So you might want to change that. Think about what you're doing different. I mentioned sawing contracts. Always use a sawing contract. You know, all the details of the payments and the cutting. A handshake may be a legal deal until you get in the courtroom. Then it's who's got the better lawyer, right? So make sure you've got some kind of general sawing contract. And usually uh, the uh, mill, the, the company that sold you the mill has example sawing contracts that they'll, they'll, they'll you know, send you. Uh, but make sure you have that stuff in there. You know, what's going to happen to the waste? You know, <clears throat> you leave and they're like, oh my gosh, you left all these slabs on my property, right? Uh, make sure that everybody understands that and that it's in a contract. Protect yourself. That's what you're doing. You're protecting yourself and your business. Safety. You can't have a portable sawmill uh, discussion without talking about safety. Know your equipment. Make sure that you have insurance for your business. Um, and make sure anybody around you is covered in that policy or they shouldn't be around you. Wear the right safety equipment and, and make sure you're theoretically not alone, right? In case something happens. So that's kind of sawing for other people and providing a service where you're taking your mill out. But what if you want to be more stationary and I, or I want to sell something at, other than my services? I want to sell a product, right? So what are you going to sell? And how are you going to sell it? Are people going to come to you? Are you going to take it to them? You know, what do people want in your area? Um, yeah, you can read online, the slab market's great, but man, if there's nobody buying slabs in your area, especially green slabs, um, then it's not a great market for you, right? Think about what's going on in your area and, and locally. Let me back up here. The other thing is, you know, when we look at trees and we see these logs, we think, oh my gosh, there's all this good material in there. But every log has high quality, higher quality material on the outside of that log and low quality material on the inside of that log. Even the, a veneer quality log 
has a pith and a heart center that has junk in it, okay? If you're gonna be in the lumber business, you're gonna salt logs for lumber, you, you've probably got a market for the high grades, but what do you do with that low grade stuff? What do you do with the three common? What do you do with the pallet stock? Um, think about the fact that every log has good stuff and every log has bad stuff and you, you've got to get rid of all of it, right? You've got to have a market for all of it. So don't think just about, you know, the high end market. What do you do with that low end stuff? Other things you can do, you know, don't, it's not just lumber. Think about pallets and pallet cans, um, pallet cans, four by sixes, that type of thing. 27% you know, of hardwood lumber goes into pallets. Now, obviously, you don't want to saw good logs up for pallets, but if you're looking for something for that heart center, a pallet market can be a great market, right? So if you're sawing lumber, you saw the outside of that log for four quarter material, and then you sell that inside piece as a pallet can. So then you're not putting lines through the saw, or I should say lines through the lumber that are going to give you a low value return, right? You end up producing a large piece of material with less cost in it. Um, and you get it off the saw and onto the next thing that's going to make money for you. Low grade logs, it's a great place to do that, but you have to have a facility close by that's going to pay you for that material. Okay. So you got to know your markets. Railroad ties. Hey, for, for the right side, right diameter material that's fairly low grade tree, low grade log ties can be a great market for that, but you got, you got to know who's buying ties in your area, what the competition is, and you got to have the ability haul that material to them. And if you're hauling ties to somebody, you're not putting the saw through the log and making the material. Crane mats or transportation mats are another pretty big market for hardwoods right now. Um, another great way to, uh, to maybe specialize a little bit if you got a long carriage or an extension to it for a long carriage. Um, great way to get rid of the heart center of the log. Again, though, you Mute. There we go. I must be putting somebody to sleep. I got mute, muted there. So, um, you but you got to have somebody in the area that, that's buying this material. So know your local markets. Look into the local market. See what's going on. Fence boards. Fence boards are a great way to take a fairly low value log, turn it into a high higher value product. Barn boards, uh, another another option for a higher value product than uh, low grade lumber. Specialty products. <laughs> is where portable sawmills excel. This gets you into a niche market. This gets you a higher value product for the same amount of labor or similar amount of labor, right? Live edge uh, boards are very popular right now. Slabs are popular. Uh, sawing up crotch wood, uh, fixed dock, quarter sawn material. You know, quarter sawn material, you're going to get 40% less material than what you would sawing it otherwise. It's going to take up a lot of time, but you can charge more than double for the same board. Okay. And so the opportunity looking into the, to, for these markets, again, a higher value return for the amount of labor that you're going to be putting in. I would encourage all of you to be looking for your local niche market, whatever that is, whether it's fence boards, quarter sawn, slabs, um, live edge, find out what that is so you can get in that market. And the thing about lumber is we think, oh, man, we can produce lumber all day. I know it's very easy to get that sawmill and start sawing up lumber. Boom, I'm in that market. But if you're producing boards, four quarter boards, like every other mill out there, you're producing a commodity product and you're you're competing against guys like this. Right. A large commercial sawmill sawing somewhere between eight and uh, twelve thousand board feet an hour. You're sawing maybe 2,000 board feet a day. <coughs> you don't want to be competing with these guys, right? So being in the lumber, the grade lumber market is not necessarily the best place for you to be. You're, you're in a commodity market, market, unless you're in an urban area and tied into specific customers like woodworkers and cabinet makers, and they come to you instead of somebody else. But it's still, you know, lumber... NHLA graded lumber is a commodity market, right? I mean, they price they price hardwood lumber in a, in price reports. This is an example of the hardwood market report uh, for last week, uh, and and you know look at what they're paying for oak right now up on the top right there, four quarter oak FAS, the highest grade truckload quantity is one thousand five. 
per thousand. That's that's just under 11 cents a board foot, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't want to be in that market because I can't produce it for 11 cents a board foot and make a profit, right? I mean, you know, our little example from Cook was was uh, 15 cents a board foot. Now, this is truckload quantities. You're not trying to compete with those guys, but 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 this is the commodity market. If people are buying that that those volumes, that's this is what they're paying on site before they pay for transportation costs. And so, do I, do you really want to be in that market? I would I would say no. I would say no. The other thing about that market is you got to be able to grade lumber. And now grading hardwood lumber, you don't have to be certified. You don't have to, to get a certification. You can teach yourself. You can go to an NHLA class. You can go to a short course somewhere and learn how to do it. But guess what? If you're grading lumber, are you sawing? And if you're not sawing, are you making money, right? Um, and a lot of markets in, in these you know, smaller areas and niche markets, you can come up with custom grades, right? You know, a cabinet shop doesn't care about NHLA grades. They just want large pieces of clear material. And if you can get a narrower piece than what NHLA says and charge a higher value for it, that's better for you. So think about that if you're selling lumber, you want to sell on the NHLA grade rules or you want to sell on, or come up with something custom that meets your customer's needs and allows you to charge a little higher value and maybe sell some thinner boards that are clearer than what the grade rules would allow. You know, this is an example of the NHLA grade rules. You can teach yourself this stuff, um, but do you really want to do that? Do you want to be in that market? That is a commodity market with, with lower values, right? The other thing, if you're if you're in the custom sawing business, you don't have to worry about logs. They're there for you, right? They're bringing them to you. Um, if you're in the lumber business or specialty business and providing a niche product for a niche market, all of a sudden you've got to get logs and you've got to get a consistent supply of the quality that you need. And that's really important. You know, free logs are free, but they can be more of a headache if they're not the quality and the species that you need for your markets. Um, you know, just some of these pictures here, you know, those logs on the left, the bottom left, those are beautiful looking saw logs, right? I mean, that's what you want for sawing grade lumber. You know, the top picture there, well, if that's, if the whole log looks like that, I'm, I don't have a lot of good grade lumber coming out of that. Down on the bottom there, those are some pretty small diameter saw logs. I, I, I hope I'm not paying much for those because I'm going to get some low grade out of that stuff. Um, and I'm going to be turning that stuff through pretty quick. So um, you've got to have a good log supply if you're going to be producing these other products. And so you're going to have to have a relationship with someone else who's going to bring you those that material. In other words, are you going to be a logger in addition to a sawmiller? Because then you're not producing lumber, right? You're not at the saw making lumber, which is going to, which you're going to be able to sell for value, you're out there cutting logs, which is you're then going to make the lumber, which you can then sell. But, well, you got to be in a higher, you got to be in a niche market with a higher value product to be able to do that, right? Um, so you might have to develop relationships with loggers in the area, uh, and you may have to pay a little bit more than maybe some of the other sawmills. It's 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 a thing you need to think about up front: is where am I going to get this this material? Because a lot of folks think, you know, I'm just going to go to the local tree service and I'm going to get all the lumber I want. Well, that's going to be different species. Some of that's a lot of that has metal in it. You have to you have to deal with that because a lot of these tree tree yard trees have have a higher uh, metal content, breaking blades, dulling blades, uh, and the consistency of the species you want and the and the quality you want um, is much more variable. Okay. <clears throat> the other problem with these logs is that they don't all they they don't all produce what you want if you're in the grade market. So this is just a slide of three different log grades: so grade one, grade two, grade three. A high grade saw log is going to produce a lot of FAS, which is the blue, and a very little bit of low grade lumber, which would be like three common, which is the orange color. You go to a really low grade log, and I've got them as no FAS and a whole lot of low grade material. Well, what do I do with that? My, my customers want FAS and one common. Now I've got a whole yard full of two and three common. I can't move. And it's, you can't, I mean, you could sell it for firewood just to get it off the lot, but you've got, you've already invested more in that than firewood is worth. So think about that as you're developing this business. What is my raw material? What do I need to make the product that I'm going to make? And how do I get a consistent supply of that at a, at a price that I'm, I can pay? Okay. Because if you're just taking what's coming, you're going to have to deal with things that, that are hard to get rid of. It's hard to get rid of two and three common material unless you got a flooring plant right down the road. Okay, 
So that's lumber, right? Lumber, it's, it, it's an easy market to get in, but it can be hard to make money in unless you've got the right market, right? So you look at this log and you look at this log and, and from a lumber production point of view, I just go, why bother? Look at that piece of junk. Well, the hobby guys are like, what are you talking about? That's beautiful, it's wood. I'm gonna get some beautiful figure out of that thing. Well, if you have a niche market, you can take that log right there and you can turn it into live edge boards like you see on the left and you can get a high value out of that when someone turns that thing into a coffee table. Now I look at that and I see a split in there and I see knots in there and I'm like, who would buy that? But that's a high value product for someone right there. That's high value. So I've taken a very low, that's a free log, right? I mean, that is pulp wood, you know? I mean, granted it's walnut, but, but I, I mean, I'm not gonna get you. That is a pallet log right there. And you're turning it into something high value, right? But you've got to have customers near you that want that stuff. And if you can find them and identify and work with them, you can get a higher value product out of something that you paid very little to nothing for, right? You might have some blade issues there, but um, you can get a much, much higher value than say the commodity lumber market, you know, right? So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not saying live edge is what you want to do. This is just an example of going from, you know, commodity lumber market into a niche market, whatever that niche is for you. Now, a lot of folks want to do soft with lumber. You know, a lot of folks will say, please custom saw for me. I want to make my own house or they buy a portable sawmill thinking they're going to make their own house. You know, houses are made predominantly with softwood lumber. Here in the South, it's Southern Yellow. Well, it's, we do cut a lot of Southern pine and use it in decks, but most homes are actually spruce pine fir from Canada and elsewhere. Um, but you're, it's, it's, these, are, these are materials that are plain to a specific dimension. They're dried to a specific moisture content and they have a grade stamp. So if you look at the bottom left there, that is the Southern Pine Inspection Bureau grade stamp. That is a number one, it's dried to 19% moisture content, it's heat treated, and it comes from mill number 406. So that mill has certified lumber graders and they pay the Southern Pine Inspection Bureau for that grade stamp. And they are inspected several times a year by SBIB folks come out and inspect them. And so there's a huge cost to being able to do that. And most building codes will not allow you to make a home uh, unless that lumber is, is grade stamped. It's right in the building code. In Virginia, you can't you can't build a home unless unless that lumber's grade stamp, and so you've got to hire a grader out of SBIB or out of uh, Timber Products Inspection, or if you're out west, it might be the Western uh, uh, what is it the WWC the Western I can't think of the name of it. But there's grading agencies that all follow the American Softwood Lumber Standard, which is a standard set forth by the D Department of Commerce. It's law. Um, you've got to hire a grader. They cost about a thousand a day plus um, travel expenses to come out and put that, to grade your lumber, put the grade stamp on it. And that lumber has to be dried and it has to be surfaced on all four sides before they can grade it, okay? So that makes sawing soft with lumber for dimension purposes, for home building purposes, virtually impossible in my opinion, unless your state has something called a native species clause, or you can get an engineer to sign off. In other words, he takes the liability of the use of that material so then you have to pay an engineer to take that liability. Um, if he's willing to sign off on it, you can do it that way sometimes as well. But several states have what they call a native species clause in their building code, which allows you to use this type of material. I know in Virginia, we don't. I don't think they do in Kentucky. I'm not sure. Um, something to look into. But in Virginia, you, you've got to have that stuff grade stamped. So be aware for softwood. If you want to build a home with it for structural purposes, you got to meet the American softwood lumber standards. It makes it very difficult. You know, niche markets, right? You got a niche product. You got big old trees. You know, most hardwood sawmills now um, can't handle logs this size anymore. Um, but you could, if you've got a specialty saw that'll do that stuff, you've got an opportunity to be in a niche market to charge a premium for what you're producing and getting a much higher value than the commodity products. I kind of already mentioned the log supply. Um, be just be aware get the log supply you need for the products you're producing that your customers will buy don't get stuck with a bunch of stuff sitting on your yard that you can't get rid of 
Now, real quick, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, some portable sawmill equipment. Uh, portable sawmills have been around for a very long time. This is a portable sawmill from, let's just say, a long time ago, right? Um, things to consider, and I don't want to get into certain details between, you know, different machines and companies, but just things to think about. You know, logs are heavy. How are you going to move those things either at your customer's site or at your site? You know, a red oak log is over 700 pounds. How are you going to get it up there? And if you're sawing and you're on a board foot per hour, you don't want to be hauling that thing up with a cable. You want to be sawing and cranking that lumber out, right? Um, when you do select a saw, you want to be loading and turning like on the left there, or do you want an automatic turner that a lot of the companies have? Um, do you want to be portable? Hey, you can leave the slabs on site. You can leave the sawdust on site. Um, but what do you do when it rains? You're not, you're not cranking out lumber when it rains. Um, do you want to be stationary? Hey, that sounds great. I can saw all year long under a roof. Well, you've got, you got to have property that has flat ground on it um, that will allow you to get around that thing. You've got to be in a place where um, zoning isn't going to get you. If you're in an urban environment, a lot of times zoning won't allow you to do that stuff. Um, and then you've got to deal with the slabs. What do you do with those slabs? Now, what do I do with that sawdust? I'm constantly cranking it out. Um, but I can saw year long. I'm there on the operation where my lumber is. So when someone drives up, I can, I can stop sawing and sell them some lumber. It has a lot of advantages to be stationary under, under a roof. Huge advantages. Um, most people, you know, unless you're selling live edge, which is a pretty good market right now, you've got to edge that lumber. How are you going to do that? You know, on the top right, you know, you can edge one board at a time if you want to. But if you're trying to, you know, if you're getting paid per board, board foot, you know, a day, how much board footage you put, put out in a day, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg to do it that way, right? Now, I can put multiple boards in there, but then I'm going to suboptimally edge my material. So I'm going to lose board footage. Um, are you going to, you know, and if you're stationary, you could have an edger, but you got to think about how am I going to edge? And if I'm, if I'm in a board foot production basis, um, how am I going to do that in an economic way that I'm not going to lose footage during the day, right? And if I got to buy an edger, now I've got to put that capital cost in, into my calculations for what my, my prices are, right? Uh, so things to think about. You know, waste, we've already talked about, what do you do with these slabs? Well, you can sell them for firewood and when they're dry, but you've got to get them off the property. You've got to get them somewhere. You've got to have a plan for dealing with that stuff if you're stationary. And then finally, when you, you know, we talked about in the beginning, when you saw, when you saw lumber, it doesn't make any money. That's the only one, someone gives you a check or a dollar bill for it, right? And so what do you do with it? How do you organize it? How do you, you got to have an inventory, right? You got to know what you have and where it is. And how do you, how do you store it? How do you get it presentable? So when someone comes on the property, they say, Hey, this is a professional operation. This guy knows what he's doing. If it's just lying all over the place and half of it's molded and your low grade stuff's falling over, uh, that's, that's not a good impression for your customers. So you got to think about how am I going to set this up and boom, there's more land for you. There's another building for you. And that means more capital expense, which means you got to put that into your prices, right? Which means that could make you more expensive than the next guy down the road. He doesn't have any of that stuff. So we've talked about markets and moving into niches. And the more you move into a niche product, the, the more your customer, the more your customer is going to want a dried product, right? And if you go from, you know, if you're sawing green material, it really limits the markets that you have access to. I mean, who buys green wood? The only people who drive, drive, you know, buy green wood are people that can use it in the green state or have a way to dry it. So you're severely limited. You know, uh, a guy building cabinets, unless he's got to dry, he doesn't want to dry lumber. He's building cabinets. A guy putting in molding, he doesn't want, he doesn't want to dry lumber. He wants it to come dry. Um, furniture maker, he doesn't want to dry lumber. He wants you to dry it for him. And so all these markets open up when you're able to, to sell someone a dry piece of wood that's graded than a green piece of wood, okay? But this requires, again, more capital. You've got to, you've got to have a dry kiln. Here's an example of a solar kiln, portable sawmill, solar kiln, boom, they're moving into that, moving into the market, uh, just as an example. I wanted to show you the prices again. So 
Well, to look at the top there, that's the green price for White Oak was about uh, just, just under 11 cents for the highest value. FAS is the highest value. Look at, look at what a one common is right now. 45 cents for a one common White Oak board. That is just terrible. The prices are terrible on the commodity market, right? Um, Walnut, 25 cents a board foot. Oof. But if you go down here to the dried prices and look at, look at four quarter FAS White Oak. It's over 26 cents a board foot, and I've, I've just dried it. So what is that? That's, that's, about, that's about 16 cents. It doesn't cost me 16 cents to dry that board. So there's a huge value added if I don't have degrade in my drying process, a huge value added for me to dry that lumber. Not only that, I can get more on my pickup truck because it weighs less when I go to move it, but also it's the market potential, right? I'm now I've got a much bigger market because there's more woodworkers want dried wood. Cabinet makers want dried wood. You know, most people in niche markets want a dried product because they're making something of, of even higher value. And so the, the ability of you to gain more market access by drying that material is just amazing. The problem is, this is the problem, you buy a dry kiln, boom, it's more capital. You start loading a dry kiln and operating that dry kiln, boom, what are you not doing? You're not sawing lumber, right? So that's, that's the catch 22, but you've got a higher value a higher value product and the ability to maybe move more product because I've got a greater market than I had before, right? Take a look at the, the material off to, your, off to the right there. You know, not only is it dried, but it's planed and edged and ready to go, right? That's stuff that, that, that's what cabinet makers want. They want to come in and have that board know exactly what it is. They don't want it rough. They don't want live edges. Well, unless they're doing live edge furniture, they want, they want to, you know, pick through that and pick the right board. Um, and you got your own grades, boom, you're off and running. One of the problems with drying that I haven't mentioned, well, I kind of mentioned it with slabs, is cash flow, right? If you're drying lumber, it's sitting around for a period of time between when you saw it and when you can sell it, okay? And so that you've got to worry a little bit about cash flow. And this is just some examples of, there are little kind of complicated graphs here, but if you look at the bottom, those, that's the month that you stack the lumber at. The axis, on the, the, the axis on the left there is how many days it's out there. And of course, the time of the year, you know, it's colder in the winter, so it takes longer. In the summer, it's warmer, so it dries faster. Let's, let's just say, let's just take a full quarter red oak, run up Virginia, I stack it out there on July 1st. If I put it out there on July 1st, I should have it down to 30% moisture content in less than 30 days. So I can put it in a dry, you know, if I'm not drying green, I can put it out in the yard for 30 days, get it to 30% moisture content, finish it up in a kiln in, in maybe 10 days and get that stuff gone. If I start sawing thicker stock, when you start getting into slabs, look at the increase just in drying time. Let's, let's look at uh, July 1st. July 1st for eight quarter material out there is over a hundred, it's 110 days. 110 days, from 30 days to 110 days to get to 30% moisture contact. And then it's going to be in the kiln significantly longer as well. And so the thicker that lumber is, the longer I'm holding on to it as an inventory cost, and the more it's going to cost me to dry that. Now you're saying, well, the flip side is I can get some major money for dry thick stock. And that, that's true. You can, but you're going to lose some of that advantage because of the, the, the time that it takes, the amount of cash flow issue you're having there. And if you don't dry it well, right, and you check it and split it and honeycomb it, then you've lost all the value in it. So you've got to know what you're doing when you get into lumber drying or you can actually lose value. So you can air dry lumber. These are just some examples. If you're going to air dry lumber, boy, I want you to have it under cover. You know, if you're only sawing a thousand board feet per day, every, every, every board foot counts. So I don't want the sun on it. I don't want it raining on it. Um, I want that stuff stacked neatly. I want you to get the most value out of it as that you can. Now you might say, well, why can't I just air dry it? 30 days, it gets 30%. I can sell it. No, if you're selling hardwoods, you want that wood to be, or any wood for interior conditions, you want it to be down around 8% moisture content. You're not going to do that outside unless you're in the dry country. Utah, Durango, Colorado, you could probably get it down there, out there, but not in the east, right? The, the lowest moisture content you'll get to around here is about 12 to 14 percent over many, 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 many more days. So then you got to have a dry kiln. 
right? And let's look, let's look at some of the dry kiln times. For four quarter lumber, let's look at, uh, we were talking about white oak there. Let's look at the white oak is in the middle and the left under species there. If I, if I dry green, he's got 23 days in there. I think that's, um, maybe that's in Colorado where they're selling that green stuff, people smoking. I don't think you can dry it for in 23 days. I'd say it's gonna be about 30 to 35 days. But you can see in an air dry condition, it's significantly less. That's why you might want to air dry before you put it in the kiln. It's, it's, it's less than a third of the time uh, if you air dry it and then put it into the kiln. And then the other thing I wanted to point out here is that's for four quarter material. That's one inch thick stock. So I'm gonna say white oak in my experience takes every bit of 30 days. So 30 days dead green in a dry kiln. If I go to eight quarter, go over here, I've got to multiply that eight quarter by two and a half times longer, right? So if I pull out my trusty calculator here, cause I'm terrible at math. If I go 2.5 times uh, 30 days, I'm at 75 days. And I, that's even probably pushing it. So it's gonna be in a kiln for 75 days at a drying cost every single day, right? And so you've got to have a market that's gonna pay you a high value for that. So. I'm pointing this out because a lot of people are, are saying how great thick stock is when you sell it. The market's hot, you can get a huge value for it. Look at the drying times that are required to dry that thick stock. Um, you know, you air dry it for a long period of time, boom, 100 days at least. Then you're gonna put it in a kiln for 75 days. You know, think about your cash flow. What am I gonna, how am I gonna feed the family if this stuff is sitting around this amount of time, right? Um, and now let's talk about a little bit about how to dry because I'm running long here. Um, solar kiln is a great way to dry lumber with no experience. Solar kilns are designed to provide a certain amount of heat through the process. Um, the, the size of the collector limits uh, how, how much heat's provided. And so it's a great way to get it introduced into drying. They're good up to about two inch thick lumber. And after that, I would, I would not use them. I don't think they provide enough heat. They have the advantage you can be off the grid. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, you don't have electricity, Boom, you can use solar powered fans. You know, the energy is coming from the sun. It's a great way to be off the grid. The problem is these things drive really well in the summer when the sun is shining. If you're in business and you've got to provide lumber at a certain time to your customer, drive to a certain moisture content, can you afford the time that a solar kiln takes? And especially in the winter time. What about that, right? So there's limitations to the solar kiln as a biz for, a, for business purposes. Um, if I was gonna use solar kilns, I'd have multiple units and I'd probably have a DH kiln at least for the winter time uh, to make sure I can finish things off in the winter time. Uh, this is an example of DH units. A lot, you know, you can buy a dehumidifier unit from I think Wood Miser makes them, Nile dry kiln makes, there's lots of D, commercial DH units out there. You build your own structure, you pop it in there. You can do thick stock, you can do slabs, you can dry all year long, you know, for a small business, DH kilns, I think are a great way to go. Now you have to know how to run them. You have to know how to use a schedule. You have, you have to know how to measure moisture content through the process. And so you're gonna have some learning to do um, before you start doing really hard to dry and expensive species or you can lose value. So there's some education there and again, but, but you can do that stuff, right? You can learn that stuff. Uh, direct fired unit. This is an example of a direct fired unit. When I was a young man in college, I bought from a guy that had a wood stove in his barn. That, he air dried it and then finished it off in the, with a wood stove, right? Just putting heat to the lumber. Uh, kiln Direct makes a lot of those units. Um, these are some DH kilns. Just, you know, build your own structure, put the unit in there, follow the manufacturer's instructions, and you're in the lumber drying business, right? Just an example of a container. Great way for small business to dry lumber. They make these units for all, you know, from anywhere from 2,000 board feet up to 80,000 board feet. Another, another option that's, that's out there is vacuum drying. And the Woodmiser came out, they used to call it the coffin kiln. It's in the black, it's so old, it's in the black and white picture, right? Um, they put electric blankets in there for heat. They pull a little bit of a vacuum using a, a, a vacuum pump for a milking machine. Uh, and they had a vacuum kiln. And vacuum kilns have been around for quite a while. They're very expensive relative to other kiln types, but you can dry lumber really 
really, really fast in a vacuum kiln. You, we, we've got companies here that are drying a four quarter hard maple in less than 48 hours. Um, good stuff. Now for thick stock, these are amazing. You're drying slabs, you're doing uh, eight quarter, 10 quarter, Vacuum kilns are a great way to do that. Now the capital cost is very high, but you're able to dry a thick stock, high value product with less, potentially less degrade and significantly faster so that your inventory cost is lower and your cash flow is significantly better. Remember cash flow sometimes is just important as about value that product and, and, and having a high value product to sell, okay? And then when you're done, though, you've got to have somewhere to sell it. You've got to keep that lumber dry. You've got to have a building. You got to, you know, you, you might want to invest in a planer because that's adding value. You get, you again, you expand that customer base. I mean, look at this place. This, this is a place people are going to come in and pay top dollar um, for some nice dried, planed, and, and uh, rectangular lumber, right? Tremendous opportunity for a different value. Now, I just wanted to throw this out. I was at... Uh, that one of these, my wife was buying some fancy cookware at some one of these fancy kitchen places. And these were cutting boards. Okay, I want you, I, the, I put that price tag up, that, that cedar on the, on the right there is priced at $69.99 for less than a board foot. Okay, imagine if you could get $70 a board foot for a full quarter board live edge, right? I just have to dry it. I just have to dry it, put a little finish on there, boom. That is a high market niche product. How do I get into that? Well, you also have to think about, yeah, how do you get into that, right? Now, of course, you're not gonna get the 70 bucks, but I mean, you could probably sell that thing for $40 to that place. How do you get into that? And how much of that can you sell though? I don't know, how many of those cutting boards do they sell in a year? These niche products, you know, finding the folks that make these is another good advantage for you because they need dried lumber. Right, you provide them that live edge board that's dried, and they finish it off. Right, you can charge more per board foot for a market like that. Um, you know, secondary products, something like that cutting board. You know, sounds like a gravy train. There's places in every state. They, my example is uh, down in Abington. On the top there is an example of uh, they showcase Virginia products there. Um, you could buy a cutting board there for sixty nine bucks. It's less than a board foot. It's dried, it's plain, it's a finished product. It's not just a piece of wood. Another example on the bottom there is up at, uh, at uh, Tamarack, West Virginia. It's a dry product, they're finished products. If you get in there and you can charge outrageous, you know, it's niche products for, for uh, with a good market. The problem is getting into these places. Uh, you've got to have a, it's a secondary product, it's a finished good, uh, and they have a jury selection all the artisans get together and look at who's applying to be there next year and they decide whether you get in or not. But every, I think most states have these areas where they should try to showcase local artisanship. So that's an opportunity if you're willing to go to the next step and start producing um, a secondary product, right? If you're producing a secondary product, uh, you're not sawing lumber, you're not producing boards, um, you got to make your money a little bit different way. Okay, so I've rambled a lot. I thought this was a pretty funny slide to finish with. Um, we all want to be happy at the end of this, right? We all want to make sure that we're, we're getting out of the business what we want. And so, you know, just think about, think about your local markets, the mill that you have or you want to have, does it meet those conditions? Who is your competition in that local area? What is your resources? Uh, think it, and then come up with your costs. Sit down and use that spreadsheet, come up with a business plan, Find out what your costs are before you start selling stuff or saying, I charge this uh, number of dollars per board foot. Know exactly what those are before you get into it. Uh, and think about the market potential you have for niche markets. Try to stay out of those commodity markets if you can. They're just, the, the value is so much lower. Now, obviously getting rid of low grade material, you might have to be in those commodity markets, but find the niches that you can. And one of the best ways to move forward to make more money in a value product is to dry that material, but just expands your markets tremendously, expands the value added that you're gonna get. Again, it's more capital. You're gonna to have to do something besides saw, right? You're gonna be taking some sawing time away to do that, but it really opens up new markets for you, tremendous. And with that, I'm gonna to try to stop and answer some questions. Great.
thank you very much. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, for you all who have questions, just feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself. And Dr. Bond, if you don't mind, I'm going to put this original slide with these questions back up again because I know sure. we had we had some folks who came in late. Um, so if you if you answered these two questions in the chat box uh, at the beginning, don't worry about doing that again. But if you did come in once we started, we, we do want to know what state or country you're you're tuning in from. So so please type that into the chat box uh, along with the question that uh, Dr. Bond posed. Do you saw as a hobby or as a business? Do you consider your your sawmill operation a hobby or business? So if you could just take a moment to answer those if you didn't. At the, at the front end, that would be greatly appreciated. So either I, I bored you to death and you're all asleep or I answered all your questions. <laughs> I have a question. Go for it. Uh, I have a small kiln. It's about 1,200 board feet. So I'm just getting used to, to drying and I want something four to five times the capacity of that. What would you recommend? A DH kiln or something else uh, in order to, that's like my bottleneck right now. We're, we're doing fine with the sawing, but I need to, I have a small uh, planer also. So we're doing a four-sided planing and I need to, you know, I have a bigger throughput. So what yeah. would you recommend for, for that size operation? So you're in, you're in Paraguay, and so you're probably sawing some, some hardwoods down there that are... I wish, I wish. We're doing oh. loblolly pine because I'm okay. not getting into that because of all the deforestation. Okay. I run a big farm here, so we have about 500 acres of loblolly pine. So it's just softwood. Okay, so with, with pine, one of the things you've got to be able to do is set the pitch. So the sap, the sticky stuff. Um, yes. And so a solar kiln is not going to do that, period. Um, when you, and so I would suggest a DH kiln, potentially. Some of the DH kilns don't get high enough in temperature to be able to set the pitch in pine. So for that specific use and that specific example, uh, maybe an indirect fired unit might might be good for you. In other words, you're going to want to get to 180 degrees probably to set the pitch at least. Um, you know, a lot of places go to 190, um, and you're going to want to stay there for at least 12 hours just just to set the pitch. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're going to go DH, you could go DH and then have a little a little another little box that you poured the heat to for 12 hours um, if you wanted to have better control because one of the problems with indirect fired units is sometimes getting uniform moisture content can be a little bit difficult um, so it is more difficult you got to watch that more closely uh, but i think for setting the pitch an indirect fired unit might be might be better for you you know, you'd probably you'd probably be getting something from Italy, like a Molbeck or or something like that, um, somewhere something from Europe. Um, check to see what those units will do temperature wise. I will. Thank you very much. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Bond. I don't know if you can see the chat box or if you'd like me to to monitor those questions for you. Sure. Yeah, we've got we've got one in there. Solar evacuated tubes. No, I've not heard of that. I, I don't have any knowledge in that. So I can't comment on that. It's interesting. I'll have to look into that. What else? Oh, man, Quebec. I've got good hard maple up in Quebec. If you're drying hard maple, dry it fast. Prevent that stain. What else? What other questions can I answer? Don't forget to unmute yourself if you're going to ask a question. The only comment I'd like to say, Doc, is, is that I've been doing this for eight years. And uh, I started out with just a hobbyist. And I still do it. I mill on weekends only. And uh, a lot of what you said is true. You need a niche. 
uh, how true that is. Uh, my niche up here in Rochester, New York, is that uh, you cut a tree down your yard, I'll come over there, I'll mill it, and then I leave. So I come to your house, I make a mess, I leave with a check. It works out well. Um, but you got to find that niche and find out where your set point is for your for your costs. Um, that was the that was the biggest thing. The biggest problem I had was how much do I charge? And, yeah, and, uh, and you know that's really common. I'm glad you said that because here you are. You've been doing it five years, and it and it was a it's a problem. You know, it was a problem for you, and that, that's why I bring it up. Is that you know a lot of times we're so we've got the saw, we're ready to go. We just kind of look out there and see what other people charge and knowing your own cost based on what your investments are and your capital and your loans are is so critical um, because, you know, it, it, you don't want to lose money doing this, right? You got to bring home the bacon. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So that was a huge, um, you know, if there's anything for anybody else that's on there, I would say that's try to find your set point and, you know, see what, see where that comes from. Um, but yeah, nice, right. nice. Nice talk, though. I appreciate all you. I got a lot of notes here. I appreciate all that you've that you've done here. Oh, thank you. I, I never know if it's too general, right? Um, another thing I want to say, we've got uh, uh, someone who came on had a little. They had their business up instead of their name. It was uh, Tom the Sawyer, and I encourage you all to type that in the internet. Tom the Sawyer. Google it and look at his website. Okay, so. Tom, I hope you don't mind me saying this, but look at his website because you need a web presence in today's environment. Even if it's just a Facebook page, you know, I, you don't want to do a web page. I hate the web page. Don't wanna, make sure you have something, an internet presence of some kind. You will be amazed sometimes at how far people will reach out because they can't find anybody locally. Yeah. Um, he it, crazy distances and you're like what well, i just can't find anybody they don't know how they don't know to call wood visors they're, they're a homeowner they don't you know they want some wood for the you know they want that heirloom tree cut up has been there they don't have any idea they don't even know what a wood miser is they're looking for somebody to saw it up you have a web presence they just type in somebody to saw my tree and boom they got you so i can't underemphasize or overemphasize how important some kind of web presence is. Now, sometimes putting your business card up in the hardware store is good, but you know, look, you know, look for wh where people who have money are going to be going who need these types of services. Uh, Doc, um, you ready for another question? Absolutely. Hi, um, my name is Richard, and I'd like to say I really appreciate the talk. And um, I'll give you a little story about myself. I'm just a hobbyist. And um, it started with me wanting to build a barn, picked up a uh, wood miser from town here, it was a barn find, a, a classmate, dad had it and he died and I, I got it. Uh, basically it was 15 years old, but it was like brand new. And I had the trees in my backyard, uh, cut them all, milled them all, built the barn. And then it just morphed from there. And, and you know, I had someone come through. They drove three and a half hours to pick up some wood today. I had a uh, flame box elder and um, I just happened upon that log and this guy built high end birdhouses and uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's uh, my next step is the kiln, uh, maybe a solar kiln um, from the, the one the Virginia Tech. I've seen the design there that you guys have. That would probably be my next step. And because uh, it is just a hobby and it's it keeps me busy. And one other thing is I have um, when I cut the trees to build the barn, it gave me more sun because we have a uh, dual axis tracker. It's a solar uh, system in the backyard. So we, hmm. we went from 10 megawatts to 12 megawatts by cutting those pine trees down. And um, I guess that's it. Uh, but a, you great talk and uh, very happy with uh, everything you said and um, very interested in what you had to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You know, eBay, you can actually sell stuff on eBay. I'm not saying you should, but if you've got a dry product, something really unique, like you were talking about a unique slab for birdhouses, you, you know, Craigslist, eBay, internet, fantastic ways to reach people you could never reach otherwise yeah i, I do that i i, sh I ship piece i ship the piece to tennessee 
Um, it was a cedar cookie. I happened upon a red cedar. My nephew, he's got the log truck. So I, I have, he's in charge of a log yard. So I have the pick. He's like, come on over. All right, I'll have one of those, I'll have a hickory, I'll have an elm, I'll have a basswood, I'll take one of, you know, and he brings them over, dice them up and uh, hit, yeah, hit Craigslist marketplace. And if you, if you offer shipping, then it goes country through the whole country, your, your ad, not just local. You brought up another good point is having a relationship with a larger mill in the area. Um, you know, if you're, if you've got a big saw, a big saw mill in your area, sometimes they've got material they don't want to touch. Um, maybe some beautiful big logs that may have some metal in them that yeah. you, you know, you could probably deal with if it was free or very small cost. Right. So yeah. make your relationship with those folks. Um, mm -hmm. They may get some odd species. They just don't want to deal with and boom, you get a, you know, just that relationship. A absolutely and the the yard the yard that he runs is uh this four or five tree companies are bringing in, in the uh, logs and he sorts them out the good stuff goes to the uh legitimate mill and i can go over and and uh and pick what you know what others don't want and and it's very lucrative very lucrative you, you know you talked about expanding it and it's uh it's kind of interesting i'm a laid off engineer that didn't want to collect welfare that's how i got into <laughs> Uh, that's why I bought the sawmill. And then uh, afterwards, my blade supplier went out of business. So I bought them. And as a second business, that's what I'm doing also. So you can, you can expand in different directions. And it's, uh, you know, you just got to be able to know what you're doing and uh, keep experimenting and you'll get there. Someone put a comment in um, about vacuum kilns. Um, about uh, iDry. There are two other suppliers um, in the United States that manufacture vacuum kilns in the United States. One of those is uh, Vacutherm. Uh, they're also, I think they're based in Vermont or New Hampshire, Vacutherm. Um, Jim, Jim Parkhurst, the Parkhurst family. Um, no, I didn't say Partridge, the Partridge family. Many of you may remember them, hopefully not. Um, Jim Parkhurst of Vacutherm, great guy, great company. There's also Dennis Sossling from um, Dennis's company is in Pennsylvania. It is called, oh, heavens. Uh, what is Dennis's company? Anyway, type in Dennis Sockling dry kilns. It'll come up. Uh, he's got a good dry kiln company. He, he, um, they make good kilns as well. Um, so those are two other suppliers of vacuum kilns in, in the United States both very good with service and getting you teaching you how to use it and schedules and all that kind of thing and vacuum therm vac, vac, vacuum therm has a uh, new vacuum kiln that has really come down it lowered the price of, of those units significantly it's a little different from their commercial units and so they've got a, a much better price point than some of the other folks what else Okay, any other questions or any questions we missed in the in the chat? Dennis's company is called VacDry. Could you Vac put the link? Could you put the link up for those maybe? Yes. For those I'll, other, uh, I'll put it in yeah. the uh, comments right now. I mean, I may go with the Virginia Tech just because it's the low cost alternative, but um it may be neat just to look into the, the one from New Hampshire. They're not far away or Vermont. Now they're going to be significantly more expensive than, uh, than a DH kill. Oh, it is a nice website. And for DH kilns, I know one company, I know Woodmiser makes a DH uh, unit that you build your own kiln. Another company that has excellent customer service is Nile, and I'll put that in there as well. Nile. If I can spell it, all right? N-Y-L-E. I shouldn't, shouldn't have said that out loud, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, all, all three of those are in, uh, oh shoot, I sent that to Gene privately. Oops, sorry about that. 
Let's put right. that out there to everyone. Here we go. There you go. It's still going to Gene privately. Huh. I'll change that. Everyone publicly. Leave it to the professor not to know how to use the computer. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Do you plan on having more meetings? Um, Phil, are we going to do any more? Well, if you're willing, I, I think uh, I think definitely uh, be it be a good thing. We've got several coming up that are not necessarily uh, sawing related. And I'll let either Jeremy or Shad kind of chime in on the ones coming up next week. But uh, but if there's interest in doing something on dry kilns or or something specific uh, to uh, a portable sawmill business, I'm I'm sure that we can definitely arrange that. Yeah, I'm game. Just let us know what you're interested in. You can shoot me an email or shoot Phil an e email and okay. uh, we can, you know, help us plan for what's next. Absolutely. I'm happy to. I'll put, uh, I'll put both those emails in here. Yeah, there's my email in the, uh, the chat box and I, okay. There you go. Dr. Bonzi. So just uh, contact us and let us know what you're interested in. And, uh, and thank you for this, uh, this good turnout. This, this definitely, uh, as far as participants coming from a wide geographic area, this, this one wins. We've got folks from all over the place. So, so thank you all very much. And um, like I said, we do a couple of Zooms, two or three Zooms every week, and not necessarily related to this. Chad or Jeremy, if you all want to talk about what's coming up next week. Sure. Next Tuesday uh, at six o'clock, we're going to have Dr. Ellen Crocker from the University of Kentucky speaking on woodland invasives. Um, and then Wednesday at six o'clock is going to be uh, uh, Dr. John Strang from UK speaking on walnuts, pecans, and filberts. Pecans for you folks from other parts of the world. <laughs> Oh, I've got a question for you. Uh, that group chat, does that get recorded somewhere? Yes. Uh, at, when I close this out, I will get a, um, and you may get it too, since you're a co-host, I'm not sure, okay. but I'll get, a, I'll get a text of, of the, all the chat, the transcript of the chat will come to me. So I can, I can send that to you if you don't. That would be great. Cause I'd like to keep track of where folks were from for reporting right. purposes. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Bond, thank you again. I appreciate this very much. And, uh, and thanks to all those who joined in. And uh, Shatter, Jeremy, any, any closes and comments? Thanks to everybody for attending. Good, good turnout. Uh, great, uh, great topic. Uh, great chat tonight. Uh, a lot of interaction. Good stuff. Thank you, Dr. Bond. I, oh, wanted, to, I wanted to thank Dr. Bond for an excellent job. And uh, uh, I think the espresso you were drinking uh, uh, benefited us. Uh, you did it <laughs> Regretfully, it was just tea. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'll do the espresso, right? <laughs> two hours, uh, Ben, two hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Great job. Uh, some, somebody asked, can you get to this after it's over? Uh, you can email me and I can send you the link. I'll put it on our YouTube page, but then I will post the link in that uh, Facebook group where, where a lot of you all first heard about this. Uh, so so I'll post it in there, post the link. It'll probably be sometime tomorrow before I get that posted, and, and uh, but that will be on our uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension Wise County uh, Facebook uh, YouTube page. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all again. I hope everybody has a has a good evening. Thank you, guys. You too. Take care. Take care. Thanks. Right.